Welcome to Real Estate 360 Live with Ryan Sloper, the trusted name in real estate radio. Now, here's Ryan Sloper. Welcome back, guys, to another episode of Real Estate 360 Live. I'm your host, Ryan Sloper. For those of you not familiar with the podcast, my guest and I will cover all angles of real estate, from interest rates to the economy to what's happening in Washington, the Federal Reserve, Congress, anything that affects you and your real estate decisions will be covered here. Uh, We're not going to just be on here ranting and raving about why it's a great time to buy. Everybody knows that interest rates are at an all-time low, and there isn't really a better way to protect yourself from future inflation. Now, we don't have it, and we probably won't have it for some time, uh, but to lock yourself into a low fixed rate, um, as we have been harping on for five-plus years now on this show, is a smart thing to do. Um, the only thing that kind of stinks is that the majority of people are not able to take advantage of low interest rates, mainly due to, you know, it's a difficult lending world out there. And if you have to be pretty much uh, cream of the crop borrower and to, get a, in, to be able to get a loan, um, you know, government loans are a little bit more expensive because the insurance premiums are there. Uh, needless to say, I will still continue to tell you that it is a great deal if you're able to get a loan at the low interest rate environment that we have now. If you haven't already done so, you can uh, download your uh, subscription on iTunes to the podcast, Real Estate 360. If you search there, you can also leave a review. Um, also, if you don't have access, obviously, to iTunes, you can go over and stream the show live at realestate360live.com. On the right-hand side, there's an Ask a Question button for any questions or topics that you maybe like us to touch on in future episodes. Uh, got a lot to talk about today. We obviously got the job of claims number in. It's been a little while. We've been a little backed up over the last week and a half, so we've got a lot to cram into today's show. Um, We've got the Fed talking head of Fisher and Dudley and Lockhart and all these different guys out there talking about what's taking place in the market, which is a bunch of bull crap. Once again, we'll dive into it a little bit deeper. We'll also talk a little bit about what's going on in Greece, the implications there. We've had uh, a drop of actually foreign countries in their holdings of our U.S. Treasury. So, Maybe dive a little into that, figure out what that means. Joining me on our panel with us each and every week is Louis Camarosano. Louis is a former attorney, a former general manager of our major real estate portal. He's often cited in the media as a real estate industry expert. He's been cited in Wall Street Journal, Forbes, Fox Business, U.S. News, MSN, CNN, and numerous others. Louis, how are you doing today? I'm doing grand, Ryan. How are you? I'm doing well, sir. Good to have Excellent. you back on, as always. Um, Thank you, know, you We've got a lot of stuff that's taken place over the last two weeks, and um, I think, you know, it was interesting right before we came on here, we were just talking, we haven't heard from Janet Yellen lately, right? But uh, who have we heard a lot from? It's been all the other talking heads of the Fed. I wanted to kind of start, before we start diving into a lot of this, is Fed Vice Chair Stan Fisher. Comments were, first quarter may be poor, but an economic rebound is already underway in the United States. <laughs> okay, I, I, I felt like that was a great place to start, right? He, um, I, I don't know where. That's how all all um, recoveries start. It gets worse. Yeah, it's and, a sign and, that it's going to get better. This is the perverted well, thinking that they use. Yeah, and you know, if if you actually that that's the first kind of. <laughs> statement that he makes that is just terrible. But then the next one says, once spring takes hold, um, you know, everything is going to start to turn a corner. So what does that mean, Lewis? When spring takes hold, when the sun comes out more, when the birds chirp more, when the grass is greener? Weatherman Fisher. You know, now we have an economy where we just disregard the entire first quarter because it gets cold. So the U.S. economy is a a three-quarter economy. Well, it's interesting because... Just throw it out. You know, forget it. Well, it was negative. Yeah, it doesn't matter because it's now spring. Well, In the modern really, era, there's no heat. You know, people just hunker down and uh, they hide in their caves all winter. and they, There's no economic activity. But when the spring comes, they're ready to spend. Well, he claims that, you know, the first quarter of being poor has been a trend over the last four years. And this is a new seasonal pattern. Okay, is the way that he's ex- explained this, a seasonal pattern. Well, Mr. Fisher, I'm just curious, why do you think that this pattern exists? Why? Does it, does it have anything to do with what the Fed has been doing over the last five plus years? Do you think that 
really, it's not a seasonal pattern. This is a year-round pattern. We've had low interest rates for year in and year out for over the last five-plus years. Do you, is, is it any coincidence that the numbers are not getting better? We have jobless claims coming in higher than expected. Once again, 294,000 versus 280,000 this past week. But you know what? They're still below 300,000. There you go. Lowest still since below. 2004, some ridiculous claim oh, that they make. Yeah, the, um, uh, the continuing claims are the lowest level since December of 2000. So let's go ahead and throw out a year almost you know, 15 plus years ago so it sounds better, right? They can always justify the data by going back and trying to find some sort of, of, of number in the past that is better than. At the end of the day, guys, how is it possible? We had housing starts for March that were 926,000 versus an estimated 1.045 million. Okay? Horrendous miss and a horrendous nominal number too. If, if, if we were really rebounding and once the spring takes hold, these housing starts would be up astronomically. Because so with the permits, Ryan, because they're the indicator that we're going yeah. to sell, right? Permits were 1.030 million versus an estimated 1.081. So they obviously these estimates are, are based upon them thinking that the spring's going to take hold, but yet we're still not getting the numbers. Right. The reason why we're not getting the numbers is because the builders know that demand is weak. Is weak. Because don't think that they wouldn't be taking permits and starting to build houses all over the place if they knew that people were going to be out there in droves to buy these homes. But Ryan, you know, I, explain the home builder confidence coming out, though, which belies the statistics you just read. They're confident that the sales expectations are good and that the traffic they're seeing to buy the homes is good. So they, they've actually... They're closest to the ground. They, the ones who are the num- their activity or what these numbers are based on, housing starts, home permits, and, and they're still seeing these bad numbers, and yet their confidence is rising or is at least above the 52, 53 um, number, which means they actually think things are going to be good in the spring too, even though their own numbers, what their own activity indicates, it's not. Yeah. The, the and why April, is that, Ryan? Because you and I talked about they believe the propaganda. Yeah, well, they have to, right? I, and I actually think that this is part of, of they have to continue to buy into the Fed's crap. They have to because they don't want to come out and say, ah, oh, looks like this spring's going to be a stinker, right? They don't want to do that because they don't want to cake on um, anything that would give people the, the perception that things are not going as they as they think they should. Oh, sure. That's like saying, I don't expect anyone to come to my restaurant. Well, then no one's going to come. Right. And, and they don't, they're not going to say, you know, we're, just, we're not getting as many sales. I mean, I thought this spring was going to be red hot, interest rates sub 4%. We have all these people out here looking. Now, I don't doubt. I really do believe that there are a lot of people out there looking. But they're doing nothing more than looking. They're professional window shoppers. Right. You know? Right. That's uh, the point with, the, with the, one of the points of the – confidence number is the traffic and sure buyers may go they may look but they not may not be able to qualify they may not have the money and they may think the homes are too expensive that and they just may be getting a comparable to a used home they're going to buy that doesn't right, well, mean you know, the sales are going to increase just because there's more traffic or there's a slight uptick in traffic well i got a good one for you because I, I have a client that um recently uh wrote a contract on a new home a new build 800000 was the price range, okay? Um, I'll give you the builder. It was uh, Ryan Holmes. So uh, newer subdivision, I, I believe that the, the prices are, are way above where they should be for actually the area, but still there's some people that are buying over there. But they're going anywhere from like the 6 up into the 8. And their model they were looking at was in the 8. Well, they have another home to sell, okay? They haven't even put it on the market. So they have a home sale contingency. The builder took only a $6,000 earnest money deposit, which on an $800,000 new bill is actually crazy. I haven't actually seen Ryan be willing to accept such low earnest money deposits for these type of things, but I think it highlights that there's not as many people out there buying because there's no way they would go for a $6,000 earnest money deposit, a home sale contingency for a home that they haven't even put on the market yet, and they're willing to accept those contracts and lock up this property. 
Right. Um, because, because they can't qualify until their other house sells, so the financing is dependent upon the other house selling. They don't have much skin in the game, which when, when it's a really good market, guess what the builders do? They ask for bigger amounts of money down, 5%, 10%. But now that they're not even just to at, hold the house for them, they're not even at one percent on this sales oh, price. Oh, oh. Okay, that's a security deposit on a rental. And we always go. Remember, uh, you and I always talk about the eye test, Lewis. So if we, if I just tell you this story, what what it highlights the economy that we're in. That right. it's 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 forced, right? Everything is forced. It's trying to you know uh, to, to make something out of of nothing, and. I'm not saying that there's not people out there that make decent money, uh, because there is. And I'm in the D.C. metro area, so we do have a lot more people. But what I think it is is that there's not as much disposable income as everybody thinks that there is out there. And somebody can qualify technically for a loan that they probably don't have the ability to repay. Now, Adam, people are going to say to me, that sounds crazy, Ryan. How can people get a loan if they don't have the capacity to pay it back. And I've gone over this on other shows. They don't take into consideration uh, your health insurance costs. They, they, they're using your gross income, not your net income. So when you start to factor out all these other things, food and all those things that don't show up on your credit report, I promise you most people are breaking even or they're going negative every single month. So you add a mortgage payment now into the mix that's higher than their previous mortgage or rent that they were paying. I'm going to guess that they're going to have to start cutting back on everything else, which means they're not going to be going out. They're going to have to spend less money on food, uh, you know, less money that's going into the economy. So it's an already very stagnant economy. So what's going to happen, you know, another year or two from now? Do you really think it's going to get better? We can't get interest rates much lower than where they're at, and we can't get these numbers to rise. I would no, and unless that, people have money, uh, rising wages or an increase in savings, what, they, what money are they going to spend? I'm not sure unless, they're, unless they borrow from mommy or daddy or grandpa or grandma. So, yeah, but all that's been brought forward. That's what people have been doing for the last four years. The consumption well, has been brought forward. There is no more tremendous demand other than in people's minds for, for new goods and services because they don't have the money to pay for them. Well, so I told you that story. Let's flip to another story. So I got another client buying a $650,000 house. This is another good example. So he's actually a really smart guy. They, they're government contractors, they make good money, selling his house, buying this new $650,000 house. Uh, he specifically told me that he, he did not want to put much money down on his house, okay, for strategic reasons. Um, because obviously not knowing where the housing market's going to go, he did have the need for more space, wanted a, a bigger yard, all, all these things for his family. So he goes over uh, to banks, Navy Fed. Navy Fed is one of the few that offer 100% financing, I think up to $800 plus thousand dollars, right? Wow. Uh, so you can potentially, you just have to be a member of Navy Fed now. There's many loopholes that you can get in that would allow you to get membership if you're a government contractor tied into uh, a military base or something like that. You don't have to actually directly be affiliated with the Navy or other um, uh, military. Um, so he was able to get a membership there. Got 100% financing for a $650,000 home with no mortgage insurance on an adjustable rate at 4.625% for five years. He looks at it as, well, guess what? I pretty much got free money because the seller paid the majority of my closing costs. I got 100% financing. I can't actually fault him for doing it because he doesn't really have much to lose there. So for people right. that can qualify for these type of programs, the market for the higher price range, it may be moving a little bit, but not everybody can qualify for those loans. You still have well, to actually very few, Ryan. Very few, but you know there 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 are those lucky souls out there that can get those type of deals, but the majority of them can't. Right. Um. And and, and I, I bring up these examples because I like to show people that you know there's stuff like these. Is what we talk about is actually going out there in in the real world, right? And the mindset, because I'm always listening to what buyers are telling me. You know, I don't want to spend really any of my money. I don't want to have to borrow against my retirement account, right? In, in a great economy, people would not be worried about spending money. I can tell you that right now. They wouldn't. And they wouldn't even, they wouldn't even need to go into the retirement account. 
they'd be no, able they to qualify. Play. They'd have they'd have savings. They'd be able to right. buy realistically what they want. No, the, the question to me would be, well, well, I, I got twenty percent to put down, so I'm not even worried. It doesn't matter. Let's just go look. You know, I'm already pre-approved, well up to this, but I only I you know only want to buy in this price range. Those right. aren't the conversations I'm having. Most of them are. Well, do you think that I can push the envelope and, and, and qualify for this house of 20000 more? I don't really know if I have the, the extra money for down payment, but maybe I can borrow that from somebody. Yeah. Those are the conversations that are taking place. Um, and those are unhealthy for an economy, and they're really unhealthy even for the individual who's trying to take advantage because he may put himself or herself in a situation where now they can't pay because their, their, their monthly costs are too high. But, you know, this, this all stems back from the Fed and the, and the, and the propaganda that, that they're pumping out there. It's right back to the mentality that when we went through the last boom and bust cycle and the whole mentality of keeping up with the Joneses, it's, it's kind of the same thing now. It's like, well, everybody else is out there. I, I got a low interest rate. I got a low interest rate. I got a low interest rate. So the next person says, well, my buddy got that. I, I want to get that too. They're, and I see this all the time. When I do a deal for one one you know, family, they tell their other family, they would not want to move, and that other next family wants to move. It still is that, you know, uh, thing where everybody's competing against each other, and when the media's out there talking about low interest rates and it's a great time to buy and the millennial talk and all this stuff, people start to convince and buy into the propaganda that's out there instead of looking at their own facts. Their own facts and then the facts that they can see using what you call the eye test, everyone else's real facts. Yeah. Uh, and our government, our president, the Federal Reserve, does not like the real facts. The real facts are they can't raise interest rates. They can't. Well, but Brian, uh, did you see what Bullard said? Now, he acknowledged what you just said. They can't raise rates, but <laughs> they're making it sound, all these Fed heads are talking at cross purposes, on purpose, to give the sense. I mean, we, you mentioned Fisher. Let's do Fisher first. Fisher said, "People need to get ready for a rate hike." So clearly, they're pumping this whole concept. We're going to do a rate hike, and the reason we're going to do it is because there's this recovery. <laughs> and then you had, and because all, really because they said there was going to be a recovery. Even if there isn't a recovery, they're going to say there's a recovery. And because they're saying there's going to be a recovery, and they said they're going to raise interest rates, they're going to raise interest rates. What, what Bullard said, he said, we could raise rates, basically just to raise them because we said they would raise rates. And then if the market reaction is negative, we'll just cut them again. Now, what kind of nonsense is that? That's an acknowledgement. That in their view of the world, things aren't better. The market can't withstand a rate hike, but because they've been saying it can, and because they're going to do it anyway. Yeah. When people have confidence in this kind of stuff, you have Lockhart, who's the chairman of the Fed in Atlanta, whose own data shows that the first quarter is close to flat in GDP. And he's saying, well, maybe we should wait. You got Katra Lakota saying we should wait till the end of 2016, the Minneapolis Fed president. So all these guys are claiming that we have a recovery, or maybe we don't, or maybe we can raise rates, or maybe we can't. Well, if we do raise rates, maybe we have to cut them again. And people listen to this stuff, and they think, <laughs> you know, and the reason and the reason they talk this way is because. They're still holding out hope, even though all the ne information, all the data about the economy is negative, that, well, it's going to get better. Just like Fisher said, well, <laughs> there's recovery already underway in the spring. Based on what? What data came out that showed there's a recovery coming in the spring? In fact, all the data in the last six months has gotten progressively worse. And, and by the way, Ryan, that coincides with the ending of QE, right, in October. Mm-hmm. The, the data has gotten worse and worse and worse, hasn't improved, and the only data they can hang their hat on had been the non-farm payroll report, which supposedly, according to Fisher, has been spectacular for the past five months, and we just had one bad one, which is we talked about when we got on the phone, Ryan, before. Well, not really, because the last two before the March one were revised downward, so they really weren't so spectacular anyway. But then again, you can say, well, that's because those months were what, January and February, and the bad one in March, well, sure, all three were bad in March because you can't hire people in bad weather. 
So this is a seasonal thing and just disregard everything. And now we have the recovery coming in the spring. Housing, remember that foolish article we, we dissected about why the housing market will go ballistic in the spring? Mm-hmm. This is spring hopes he home springs eternal in the human <laughs> This is ridiculous that they pull this every year. And last year, we did get GDP growth in the second half, in the, two, the second and third quarter, but not the fourth quarter, mostly because of Obamacare spending. An increase in that, which is not a good thing for the economy because it highlights, to your point, that leaves less money to buy other things than to buy homes. And because of the inventory build, which the inventory build now is not going to be built up in the second quarter of this year because I saw a chart showing that the inventory to sales ratio is off the charts now, mm-hmm. meaning that companies have so much inventory in relationship to the amount of sales they're making, which means that they're not going to be building more inventory to boost the GDP. In fact, they're going to try to sell down that inventory. And if they try to sell it down at current prices, they won't sell much of it. So they're going to have to lower prices, which will give us the Fed's dreaded deflation. Well, if you have deflation and the strong dollar, which they're already blaming, they may not be able to raise rates. They're looking for a reason not to raise rates, but yet they want to raise rates because they want – their scenario to play out that the economy is improving and therefore can withstand higher rates when they know the economy is not improving and it can't withstand higher rates, but they're looking for a way to either raise them anyway or have a solid excuse not to raise them. Now, Ryan, we also talked about, just want to get this point in about the drop in foreigners' uh, holdings of U.S. treasuries. Now, we know that China has so many treasuries, $1.23 trillion, Japan has about the same, and that Russia has been dumping their treasuries because they're basically at war with the United States financially. So they've dropped their treasury securities from $150, $60 billion uh, about two years ago, and they're down to about $69 billion, and they sold about $12 billion in, in, in February, the most recently released numbers from the treasury. So that's to be expected, and then Russian rubles under uh, – attack because of low oil prices. So they've kind of got two reasons to get rid of their U.S. treasuries. They need the money, and why pay into a system (laughs) that views them as the enemy? And they didn't have that many to begin with. But the real issue is China and and Japan have been the two big stalwarts for buying U.S. treasuries and helping to fund our deficit spending. And – they dropped fifteen billion in China. Dropped fifteen billion in um, February, and Japan dropped fourteen billion. And overall, if you net out all the companies, all the, I mean, all the countries that sold or bought treasuries or changed their positions in February, it was a net drop. Something we haven't seen. I haven't seen in two or three years a net monthly, month over month drop because generally countries add to their foreign reserves. And the only thing I can think of, Ryan, how this might tie into this Fed raising rates talk is they see, and also even Belgium, the supposed mystery buyer, their holdings dropped in February too. Mm. So what I'm thinking is perhaps the Fed sees that Japan is not going to buy U.S. treasuries. China is not going to buy U.S. treasuries. Other countries also dropped. Switzerland, France, Great Britain, you know, three, four, five, six billion in February, they're not going to buy treasuries and not get a return, especially if uh, they don't need U.S. dollars because they're joining the AIB, AAIB, the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank. They also don't need as many dollars because the oil price is lower. And if you need dollars to buy oil and oil is less, you need fewer dollars to buy them. So maybe the Fed is thinking we have to raise rates because we need to drum up some demand, and that demand can't infinitely just come from us, the Fed, buying, printing money out of thin air and, and buying treasuries to keep rates low because by doing so, we're chasing away the foreign capital. Now, I don't know if this is true. I don't know if it's not a trend, but it was fairly significant to see in February a drop in all the major players who generally add to their uh, U.S. Treasury holdings. This time in February, they cut. So we'll keep an eye on that. If this is actually a trend where the Fed basically is using as a cover story the increase 
in the U.S. economy and needing to normalize interest rates. None of it makes sense when everybody else is, is um, selling. I mean, everyone else is easing for the U.S. who worries about deflation to be going on this uh, raising rates kick. Unless they're doing it for another reason, they need to continue to attract the foreign investment from China, yeah. uh, Japan, and the, and the rest of the countries. Yeah, I mean, and I could see that this would actually kind of put a lot of the, the Fed members in a little state of panic, right? Uh, if this is a continuing trend, who picks up the slack? Right. That's what we said all along, that rates are going to rise when the Fed stopped buying $85 billion. We said, who is going to buy 80, those extra $85 billion at that low price that mm -hmm. the Fed was buying them? I mean, at that high price and low interest rate that the Fed was buying them. We said, and once the Fed stopped buying them, the demand will not necessarily dry up, but at least the demand that the Fed or to, what the Fed was buying would dry up, and therefore rates would necessarily rise just because they would be removed from the market. And then we saw all of a sudden Belgium picked up the, almost identically the amount of slack, and there was no change in interest rates. They didn't go higher. In fact, they went lower. Hey. But now we're seeing, and, and, and we also didn't see any decline in real decline from other, the other major countries until now, just two days ago when they released the report, the February holdings of these countries and overall have dropped hmm. their holdings of U.S. Treasuries. It is, it is going to be something uh, probably worth uh, you know, following and, and see how that plays out. Because, um, or, or if there is another mystery buyer that just shows up out of the blue, right? Um, well, Belgium actually dropped which is interesting. They were the mystery buyer. They cut their holdings too. Yeah, and, and for, for a lot of those countries to kind of cut their holdings, and it's almost like it's in, it's in tandem, you know what I mean? Um, they're, well, let me give you a quick read. Yeah, because you had Japan cut uh, $14 billion, China cut um, $15 billion, billion, Belgium cut about 8 or $9 billion, Switzerland cut $4 billion, United Kingdom cut like 92, like 13 billion um taiwan cut 3 billion ireland increased slightly you know and the, the rest of them are, are are smaller countries and have smaller holdings but the point is that the the top 10 holders eight or nine of them dropped their holdings and some of them relatively significant for a one month um period yeah yeah, so and there was no real news. In fact, the news in the Wall Street Journal, which I found amusing, was it says they made it sound like, you know, after the February numbers are released, Japan replaced China as the number one holder of U.S. Treasury. And their headline implied that somehow Japan is sopping up, you know, they're, they're grabbing all these treasuries now that they've, they've overtaken China. It's not true. They only overtook China because they only sold $14 billion, where China sold $15 billion. So it's not like Japan is on a buying spree to vault them into the number one position mm -hmm. of U.S. foreign holders of U.S. treasuries. It's only because they didn't sell as many as China did. And Japan, if people think that Japan is going to save the United States, because <laughs> Japan, Japan is buying every last Japanese bond. They can't also buy you know, 25% of the newly issued U.S. bonds, right? And then China, yeah. China has its own reasons. Forget being in it. They're not really an enemy of the United States. They do a lot of trade with the United States. So they're not really looking to upset the apple cart. But here's an interesting statistic. You know how our economy, the United States economy, is 70, 80% consumer spending, which is new and I have talked. That's not really a good thing, but be that what it is, that's what it is. China is, has, is approaching 50%. Well, what does that mean? That means they'll be selling fewer exports, which means they'll be receiving fewer dollars that they have to put into U.S. Treasuries. So there again, you have another strain on the dollar. This has been a, a long predicted trend that once China starts consuming what they produce, that's going to be a problem because then cheaper goods are not available to the rest of the world. You know, why would a Chinese factory worker work 18 hours a day and only and, and not consume the benefits of his labor mm -hmm. so it looks like the chinese are starting to consume more and more which means that the united states will not be getting the same deal they get on that we get on goods imported 
from China because a lot of them are going to stay in China, which means also they're not going to be importing as many dollars, which is another drag on the dollar. And also, right. if as the dollar loses demand, that creates inflation for us because their ec- imports become more expensive. Right now, the opposite is happening. The dollar is strengthening in this temporary period, which causes deflation. But that all, this all can flip around very quickly, Ryan, if the dollar falls out of favor and the price of the dollar you know, reverses course and drops, then everything's going to get very, very expensive, and they'll have their inflation. Yeah. But it won't be the good kind of inflation that they think. Well, it would make sense, uh, based upon what you said there, for the Fed to start, you know, creating that, that talk and propaganda that, hey, uh, you know, spring is sprung. Looks like we're going to be lowering rates or, or raising rates come the fall, right? Uh, because the market has already been rebounding. You guys are just, you guys are just catching on to that? Because this has been going on for some time now. Come the fall, we're going to be raising rates to start to try to set up this, you know, more, more foreign investment back uh, to our treasuries come the fall, uh, or even before then at this point, if this becomes a continuing problem, um, and then all, only to have to reverse course again because they can't really afford to right. raise rates. And as Bullard mentioned, we might just have to cut them again, right? So <laughs> they might have to make the move to get to, you know, to basically create some more uh, demand there for, for our treasuries and then reverse course again because our economy is falling. We can't afford to pay higher rate, interest rates on our debt to begin with. Uh, it, well, then you've just given people a gift, right? You've lowered the cost of their bonds by, by raising rates, right? Mm-hmm. And then when you cut rates, you make them more expensive. So now those countries that bought during that time period, they bought themselves another few months, they're happy with their new holdings. Mm-hmm. Because they bought them at the lower cost, and now they've gone back up again because they've lowered rates. Just for our listeners, there's an inverse there's an inverse relationship between bond prices and yields. When bonds are more expensive, then the yield is lower. When bonds are cheaper, the the yield goes higher. Mm-hmm. And you know, it's one of those times too, and, and we always talk about the relationship to like stock and bond prices, and typically when stocks were going up, but you know, bond prices are going down. Uh, but what we have seen over the last year plus now is, is that there is no predictability to the market. A lot of the time they can go in the same direction, uh, up or down, or just randomly back and forth in opposite directions, but for no rhyme or reason. Um, I, the Fed officials are out there saying to the markets, hey, don't expect for the rates to stay low forever. Well, why should they not believe that they're going to stay low forever until something crashes? An interesting statistic for this healthy economy that we have, according to, this is a CNN money, so take it for what it's worth, 71% of the companies that went public with IPOs in 2014 were unprofitable. Yep. That's, that's nearly as many as the year the last dot-com bubble yep. burst, when 80% of the IPOs had no profits. But yet, and, and, no, and no real anticipation that they will make profits. It's, it's, it's all, it's, it's just this illusion that, you know, we're just continuing to infinity for the stock market based upon what? It's the based Fed, on what the, Janet Yellen's saying, that cash is not a convenient store of value. She's right. They've made it not a convenient store of value. They've made it a losing proposition. They want you to spend it. They want it in the stock market. Or even worse now, they're talking about they don't even want you to have it. They want to eliminate cash. <laughs> they want an entirely controlled economy where they push the blips and beeps and the digital uh, money, so to speak, wherever they want. They don't want people to have any control over what they do. They don't want people to save it. They don't want people to put it and to hold on to and spend it as they choose. They want to create an economy where a certain amount of money gets spent on this and a certain amount of money goes into the stock market. And the only way they can make you do that is by making you do it. Because if, they, if you have the cash in your hand, you may not do what they want. You may do what makes sense for you, not for them. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's, you know... All of the numbers, all of the facts, and we talked about this on the phone before we came on, show and, and, and should bring you to the conclusion that this is a disaster, okay? But the fact that... <laughs> Objectively correct. 
Yes, but the fact that Yellen, Fisher, Bullard, Lockhart, I mean, we can go through all of them. Cox Lakota. Yeah, the, 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 they can keep... Dudley. Know, one, uh, Dudley. They can continue to say one thing and, and, and get, get somebody's you know, opinion going one way, and then another one says something and gets you going the other way. You get caught in limbo, and, and people are not able to accurately figure out what's taking place. And so they, they You're on a tightrope, basically, Ryan, if you think about it. They are trying to keep you, the economy and the consumer and the, and the public on a tightrope, and it's, it, they're going to tip it over. You're going to fall off. You can't keep this balance of economy is good, no, it's not good, economy is strengthening, no, it's not. In fact, Reuters, Ryan, I found the first Reuters article. Normally, you know, any, any number that comes out, that's, whether it's good or bad, usually it's bad, it's robust, it's solid, it's a sign of strengthening the economy, accelerating rate hikes, all that kind of propaganda they put out, no matter what it is. And if it's bad, well, it was the weather, it's going to get better in the second quarter. Economists believe strengthening, accelerating the third quarter. There was an actual article by Reuters that said the, the recent data was weak. And I thought, whoa, wait a minute. Is this a new reporter? Did he not understand his job is to use the word solid and recovery? You know, does he need to go to a re-education camp and relearn what he's, the propaganda he's supposed to put out? Or, Ryan, is it now the Fed in control of the media is saying, start to plant these stories that, well, there, are, there is weakness in the economy in case we need to backpedal? Of course it is, Lois. Of course it is. Because there's no right. way a story like that gets out there. And Reuters, who yeah. everything is robust, strengthening, whatever superlative you can use, whatever you use the word weak to describe the economy. No, because you know what? We always talk about this, that, that these Fed officials, they meet in a room together. The conversations that they have behind those closed doors, we don't actually hear those conversations, but they have to be talking about the stuff we're talking about. They, they, they have to know that they're in a world of trouble. They have to know that there's really no way out. They have to know that they can just have to turn on the printing press again at some point in time, that there is not any other option. They've went down this path. They've kicked the can so far. Our, our, our government is not willing to cut their budget. That's never going to happen. They can't, you know. And, it would make, and, and, and Ryan, even if they did cut the budget, it still would do no good. There's too much no money owed. There's too much money. You just have to tell people, there's no government now, and, that, and we're going to go anarchy. That's not going to happen. It's not Even means happen. testing, social security, any of that stuff, still, it, it will not reduce. You can reduce. If we have $160, $200 trillion worth of unfunded liabilities, $18 trillion deficit, you can cut it in half, and you still owe $9 trillion that you can't pay. <laughs> you, still, you, can, you still owe $80 trillion in unfunded liabilities. All right, cut three quarters of it. Now look what the government looks like. It's not going to happen. And even that, they couldn't repay. Look what happened well, to Greece. They can't repay. Look what they have austerity. They, they just basically can't pay their workers without borrowing more money and getting debt forgiveness. The United States is no different. Except well, that and, people and, keep lending us money, and it looks like, and I hope February's not a trend, that China, Japan, either they can or won't continue to buy and are starting to sell. Well, so then how are we going to fund our deficits and our unfunded liabilities? By raising rates? Yeah, you might attract more, but then we've got to pay interest on that. Right, that's, that's which we can't afford to pay. It's obviously not the answer. And, you know, the more and, – and, and people expect for, for the, you know, this, the economic situation to turn around when we have workforce participation at basically an all-time low, or I think it's like second to the Great Depression – um, the percentage of the population right now that's dependent upon the government for subsidization um, so on welfare or support, I believe it's somewhere around like 44%. And, I, and, I and what about the in, companies uh, that are, are also dependent upon? Yeah. Our, our banking system is dependent upon the government. I mean, this is a socialist regime here, and you know, it's at 44%, almost 50%. That's the point of no return. We're already at the point of no return, but it's just getting sure. worse. It's, more, it's less and less productive. And you point more, out that people will vote themselves a raise. Once they realize they can do that, they will. 
And you're right, Republican or Democrat, you can't win saying I'm going to cut yours or somebody's benefits. You just lost the election because you could lose 20, 30, 40 percent of the vote just by opening your mouth and even suggesting that you're going to cut something. Yeah, well, and isn't it interesting that, um, you know, Rand Paul is obviously planning on running for president. And when you go to his website, his, uh, they actually have gotten a little bit about, better about their marketing message, like Obama and is using hope and change. Well, Rand Paul is stand with Rand, defeat the Washington machine, right? So the Washington machine, does he really think that he's going to defeat it? Does he really <laughs> Does he really think that he's going to change or do anything different? Absolutely. Than- he's running off his dad's name, and he's basically running as a Republican. He wants to means test Social Security. That, that's a losing proposition to means test Social Security for two reasons. First of all, you lose all the people that paid in and feel like they're entitled to it because they paid in. Why shouldn't they get it? And second of all, it doesn't really do any good anyway. It doesn't solve the problem to means test Social Security. He doesn't win votes by doing that. <laughs> he's uh, he's so far, ran. and he's also not winning the libertarian vote because they're not in favor of. See, he he's in favor of many government things. He's got the same foreign policy ostensibly as the rest of the Republicans. He is not. A, he's a small government guy, but he's not necessarily a. Uh, a libertarian in the sense that he wants to eliminate. He has, he's not talking even the way Rick Perry is talking about eliminating uh, federal agencies. So, yeah, it, it doesn't matter who the Republican is or the Democrat is. And I'd like to get your views on Hillary Clinton in a minute. <laughs> who, who, who gets in? Because they're not going to take the bold action that's required to put the country on the right path. They're going to take the bold action, just like a Bernanke. They say the bold action to get reelected. Bernanke had the audacity to come out and say, call his book. The, uh, the courage to act. And he, did, <laughs> he, he did the most cowardly thing. He just uh, held out the banks and printed money. But back to Hillary Clinton, I mean, wh- where do you think that train is going? Well, she's going to win, um, in, in my opinion. It doesn't matter what she's done. She, she can have been using her personal email for the last 30 years. She can uh, ha- have been to the poorhouse, <laughs> been broke. She can be all these things. I don't really care. She could have and actually it, held the machine gun at the Benghazi uh, embassy, and she'd get yes. elected. Is that what you're saying? And she, and she, yes, and she could still. She could have orchestrated like, the attack from her private email. She, yes, yeah, she could have done <laughs> evil things her, her her entire career, which many people know that to be the truth. But the, at the end of the day, that 44 percent number that I gave you, uh, if they feel that Hillary is going to give them the best opportunity to keep their yeah. entitlement, their welfare, that is exactly who's going to get in office. And if stand yeah. with Rand, if he thinks that he's going to win based upon defeat the Washington machine, and if that the Washington machine, machine is working for most people, that's why would you want? Why would you want to defeat it? And out of fear, the Washington fear, machine is paying my food stamps, is paying my education. Why? Why do I want to defeat that? Right. The Washington machine is not telling people that you need to be more productive, that you need to actually earn your keep. They're not. They're saying we'll give you just enough to keep you happy. And maybe we'll even give you just a little bit more just so you don't go out and start robbing people. But they're going to keep you, you know, complacent to where you don't need to do anything. And that's exactly what Hillary will do. She'll continue and, then, and people will look past the hypocrisy or they won't even see it. I was dead broke. I'm the champion Lewis, of middle class. They don't even care. They don't of care. course not. The whole, the whole country is pretty much corrupt as far as the political you know, political system goes. Well, it doesn't you get matter. the leaders you deserve. I mean, basically, she's a reflection of the population then. Uh, of, of course, and that's why it, it, it's a joke to think that, you know, like when on, and on his website, like it's Liberty, not Hillary. They, they can create all these funny captions and, and titles and headlines, but at the end of the day, I'm going to tell you right now, Bill Clinton's going to get out there, and he's yeah. going to win the election for her. She's probably going to keep her mouth shut for the most part, and Bill will go out there and, and win. Don't attack my wife. <laughs> well, and it's, you know, I, I hate talking about this. And everybody's always like, oh, well, you don't know, whatever. I'm like, okay, just, just look at the facts, the facts, the eye test. More and more she shouldn't even be on. a candidate with all of her baggage. She would have been run out of town 30, 40 years ago by the media. If Nixon, if Nixon said, I'm going to erase the tapes, you're not getting them, yeah. they would have sent the federal agents in there to to um, 
confiscate his tapes. Have you um, have, have you watched the TV show House of Cards at all? I know I brought up that before. Yeah, I think that, uh, I haven't watched. That's the one with Kevin Spacey, right? Where, where yeah, Clinton it, said it's it's pre, it's pretty much like that, only yeah, it's actually have, worse. <laughs> you have to watch it, and our listeners, you you have to watch this because I almost feel like what they do in that show is predict what's going to happen in real life, right? And it's you know Kevin Spacey, you know the Democratic president, and essentially you know he's not going to. They're trying to force him out. They're telling him that. But he's trying to ram a jobs plan through, and essentially he tells them that if you if you get this jobs bill through, then I'll tell the you know I'll tell the world that I'm not going to run for the next seat. And then a, you get a woman that's coming in to basically run for the next seat uh, presidential election. So it, to me, it's funny because I feel like that's exactly how I view the United States. Like that's exactly how I can see things playing out. Uh, and and I don't don't think that things are going to change, guys. We're hey, gonna any it. criticism of Hillary would be uh, an indication of sexism, uh, not wanting to give women a chance. This wouldn't have happened if she was a guy. You know that that's the you won't be able to criticize her either. Mm-mm. Or this other guy did worse. How come you're bothering her? And then you have big, like I said, Bill Clinton will come out. Stop attacking my wife. She's been you know <laughs> she stood by me. You know there, there's going to be <laughs> so much mocked up sympathy for her people will defend her they will vest their interest in defending her especially as she gets attacked more and more for legitimate reasons finally people say it's unseemly to attack this poor woman she's not a poor woman and figuratively or financially (laughs) she is not a poor woman but she will get that sympathy not because she panders for it she'll pretend like she doesn't need it all of her minions will create the fact that this poor woman is being attacked. This poor woman. This poor woman. Yeah. I mean, you know, how it, we're talk, let's bring this back to real estate. That this number, every time I look at it, it it's that what the show is about? Well, for it, you know, it, because we always bring it back to okay, so how and why is real estate doing what it's doing based upon what's taking? Because everything stems from the Federal Reserve. It, it, this is why what we have going on in the real estate market all comes from this. If we actually had interest rates probably at a 6% level, um, things would probably normalize a little bit uh, because investors would be willing to take more. But why would you, Ryan? You're making the right point. Is They want to get Hillary – Yellen wants to get real, Hillary elected so she gets reappointed, so she mm-hmm. has to keep rates low. Yeah, because and, and remember, it was back – It'll destroy the economy at least short term if they raise rates. Well, and, and, and then I Hillary always, has no shot. Because, I, have, I mean, then y'all will have no shot. Right, and I've said from the beginning that nothing bad would ha- happen on Obama's dime. And if you go back and listen to the hundreds of episodes before this one, I, I maintain that nothing bad will happen on Obama's dime because they've got to get Hillary in there. Because they have to continue this nonsense. So that 44% number, number of people that uh, are getting outright welfare and support, it'll probably be closer to 50% by oh, And they want to get illegal immigrants the right to vote. They've already given them the right to reclaim money on taxes they didn't pay while they weren't paying or filing. So, I mean, the more you hand out, once politicians realize they can hand out stuff and get reelected, which they realized long ago, and then once uh, the public figures out they can vote themselves a raise, it's over. It's heading in that direction. Well, uh, what I'm curious about is, is when, you know, es- essentially the government takes over everything because this number's at 44%. Once it gets to 50%, it's pretty much game over, but it's already game over anyway. Are they going to start to, like, give loans based upon how many kids you have and how much – Why not? I mean, why not, right? Like, they, they're going to start to have to create – It's not things. fair that if you can get welfare, but, but if you can't buy a house, that's not fair. <laughs> and you can't buy a house because you have higher expenses than somebody else because you have more kids. That's not yeah, well, fair. You, you, you've got to give them the ability to buy a house. And if you can't give them the ability to buy a house, you're going to have to give them a house. Well, you're basically saying right from the jump that only about 56% of the population right now has the ability to buy a house. Right? That's not fair. Yeah, so in, in order to make this a level playing field, we need Everyone to has to have a house. It's like everyone has to have health care. Everybody has to have everything. Well, and, and don't think that that's not coming. <laughs> of course it is. But then you'll be like Cuba, where no one has anything, but at least everyone's equal. Although, yeah, <laughs> And, and it's unfortunate because it's like this, this path, you know, that we've taken started five plus years ago, and everybody, including Wall Street, continues to buy in. Actually, it started over 100 years ago, with well, yeah, it, but, it, it, but, but it accelerated the last five years. 
it's accelerated to epic proportions, I would say, in the last five right. years because of, of what they've done for such an extended period of time. Uh, and, and, you know, with the bank bailouts and then, you know, strategically picking what, what companies, corporations, banks are able to continue to, to maintain and stay alive. And, you with know, now with we have Warren to, Buffett's approval and guidance. Yeah, and we have, we have a, a low interest rate environment that, honestly, if everybody was able to take advantage of it, I promise you interest rates would not be where they're at. They know that the majority of people can't take advantage of them, which is why they keep them low. Yeah, because the people that can take advantage of them are making mint, buying assets on the cheap and having asset prices rise and seeing their portfolios rise. QE is great for homeowners. QE is great for stockholders. It's just that what's interesting is only 10% of people own 90% of the stock. Yeah, QE is great for startup companies, investors that want to take you know risky bets. Because, I don't even you know, want to make a profit. I want to. I just want to sell my shares to the to the venture capitals who will then sell them to Wall Street, and we'll all make millions and billions of dollars. And we'll hire a bunch of workers that don't do much because they're not really. You know, workers are not productive. I don't know how they measure productivity. If the company they work for doesn't make any money, that's not productive <laughs> work. That's that's unproductive work. Uh, if they just make the stock price go higher, they view that as production, that the national wealth is tied up in the stock market of companies that don't make money. Uh, Lewis, you're making too much sense. Can you please stop talking? Yeah, it's, it's, like late, it's late in the show. <laughs> yeah. I mean, <laughs> but it's, it, it's, we laugh about this stuff because, you know, when you listen to those other shows, MSNBC, CNBC, they bring on these analysts that will look at things, you know, every which way from Sunday and twist and get you to buy into the hype. Guys, after over five plus years of the same stuff, at what point do you just say enough is enough? I'm tired of this crap. It's not true. Because we've been there. And, you know, we do this show because we have to continue to talk about it and hopefully shed more and more light. I mean, as we mentioned about paying attention to, you know, the foreign holding of U.S. Treasury. That's something that they don't talk about. Because if they did talk about it, people would actually start to question, well, why well, is They that talked happen? about it in the sense that it's a great thing that Japan is buying more. They're not. They're not number one because they bought more. They're number one because they sold less. Right. So at the, at the end of the day, you know, we still have a low interest rate environment. Um, we still have much of the same. We still got the same Janet Yellen same Federal Reserve, same Hillary Clinton. Not much is going to change in the near future. I nope. talked about this being the lost decade. Let me make that decades at this point. Century you're going for? Uh, could be century. Because once you go down that path, Lewis, it's, yeah. history's proven that it's very difficult. It, yeah, and then you get them, them talking about, well, there's structural changes, there's seasonal changes, like Fisher saying, people at the IMF. Yeah, ones that you created. Mm-hmm. You know, they, they, they're like observing it like they're an impartial observer that they're seeing, well, look what's happened here. It's just happened and there's nothing we can do about it. Yeah, there is. You can stop doing what you've been doing for the last 20 years and step aside. And then maybe we wouldn't have these structural changes and imbalances because you well, created the structure. Right. They don't look at what's been going on uh, the last 20 years as any form of insanity, right? They look well, they don't at look it at it as any form of anything to do with it when they had their hands in it the entire time. Right. It's not. They like to blame the market for stuff that they've done that didn't work out right. <laughs> that gives them I, more opportunities to do what they want to do to fix it. Right. I don't. I don't have that luxury as a business owner. I wish I did. <laughs> it's uh, your customer's fault. It, it, they haven't it, sent you enough money. Right. I don't know why they're not just you know writing checks every day and just putting them in the mail to me. Uh, it, I, it's you know, but I should. I should believe that that's going to happen based upon what's being pumped out there. There's a recovery. There is a recovery. And I'm telling you, Luke, hopefully by next week, my grass will be a little greener. The sun will be a little brighter so that next week we can give some better numbers. Um, we know now that that's not going to be true, but we're here at the end of the show. I want to thank you for coming on, Lewis, as always. And if you wouldn't mind, give our listeners your blog so they can check out all your posts on gold, silver, real estate, the economy. Oh, sure. Thanks. It's uh, smogel.com, S-M-A-U-L-G-L-D. Please check it out. As Ryan said, analysis on real estate, gold, silver, the economy, and the Federal Reserve. So check it out, smogel.com. Thanks, Ryan, and thanks, everyone.
Thanks, guys, for tuning in. We'll be back again next week. In the meantime, feel free to download, subscribe, share the show on iTunes. Also, you can stream it live at realestate360live.com. Until next time.